Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, the EDM Tools Network for short, which is co-coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. And um, uh, with me, I have Nick Weiner from Open Channels, who is going to be co-moderating this webinar. And we're super pleased to have Kathy Gooden, who's the director of NatureServe's Marine Program, with us today to talk about identification of Gulf of Mexico ecosystem indicators using an ecological resilience framework. Um, and as we were getting ready, we were uh, just thinking of everyone in Texas and, and Louisiana and hoping everyone is doing well. and. Um, just sitting out our thoughts to everyone. So uh, before we get started, I wanted to um, let everyone know how to ask questions. There's two ways to do that. You can type the questions into the question panel of the user interface, and then I'll relay the questions to Kathy. We'll have um, a good amount of time at the end of the webinar for question and answer. Um, but you can go ahead and send your questions in throughout the webinar, and we highly encourage you to send them in whenever they occur to you. Um, and or you could raise your virtual hand and be unmuted and then uh, we'll unmute you and ask the question directly to Kathy. This only works though if you've uh, got a if you're if you're using the computer if you have a working microphone or if you're using the telephone option if you've entered your PIN number. Um, so anyway, Kathy, thank you for being with us and we'll we'll turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Oops, I went forward one extra here already. Uh, thanks everybody for your time in, in attending today. Um, I really want to talk about a project that was funded by the NOAA Restore Science Program in 2015 to help them meet the priorities that they outlined in their science plan. And our goal here was to develop a set of ecological integrity indicators along with the ecosystem service indicators for five ecosystems in the Gulf of Mexico using what we're calling an ecological resilience framework. And our, <clears throat> excuse me, our intention was to sl select indicators that would support management, restoration, damage assessment, and recovery. Um, our first step in this framework is to develop conceptual ecological models that outline the drivers and stressors and the major ecological factors and key at uh, ecological attributes of the system, um, and that, as well as the key services that, um, that they provide. Ultimately, uh, the idea is to, and we have developed metrics and assessment points or thresholds that will allow us to gain a better understanding of the ecological integrity and the ecosystem service provision for each of these five ecosystems. So the five ecosystems are right here. Uh, they include salt marshes, mangroves, seagrasses, oysters, and corals. Uh, we chose these five ecosystems to start with because of their widespread nature across the Gulf. Um, and their importance in the Gulf in providing um, in ecologically and in providing ecosystem services. Um, corals are less studied and less widespread in the Gulf, and we included them nonetheless to show a variety of cases that might be encountered as we try to develop ecosystem indicators. Um, and we organized our project team around each ecosystem. So we had a number of um, project teams. We had five ecosystem specific teams and one ecosystem services team and one mapping team. Um, so I'm reporting on the, uh, on the work of this great group of experts. Um, so the folks from the USGS focus mostly on the salt marshes and mangroves. Um, the Florida Wildlife Research Institute um, uh, uh, folks focused on corals and some of the indicator mapping work, along with Matt um, Love from Ocean Conservancy who also worked on that mapping work. Uh, from the Nature Conservancy, we had Jorge Brenner, who was worked on um, across the teams on the ecosystem services piece, and Chris Shepard headed up the oyster team. And then the folks from University of Texas at Austin led the seagrass team. And Nature Service role, uh, myself along with Don Faber Langendoon, were really focused on the development of the methodology and implementation to make sure that we develop a uh, consistent set of products among the teams. So we had a number of project objectives uh, to develop the conceptual ecological models that include both uh, in ecological integrity indicators and ecosystem services indicators to identify key indicators, metrics, and measures that should be used to monitor them. Um, we then uh, we created a draft and then had the experts um, evaluate and guide our work. 
The idea was to try to understand what indicator data are already being collected and where they're being collected so that we could determine gaps in the alignment between the proposed indicators and what's being collected now. And finally, make a recommendation of a, a comprehensive uh, set of indicators for these five ecosystems for the Gulf. So why would you do this anyway? It, um, we need indicator data to support a number of important applications for resource management and conservation. Uh, for management in, of sustainable ecosystem and living marine resources, we need indicators that track the linkages between the drivers and the stressors, ecosystem condition, and the managed species, and the ecosystem services that are provided by the ecosystem. As far as damage assessment and recovery planning, we need indicators that support the, to support the establishment of baseline ecosystem conditions and the service, ecosystem service status. Um, Indicators can we can provide specific metrics and thresholds that are needed to um, to assess the impacts of the major disturbance events like what's happening now with uh, Hurricane Harvey in the Gulf, um, and the um, conceptual ecological models and the indicator thresholds can help managers specifically develop ecologically appropriate uh, recovery plans. Um, for restoration planning and evaluation, uh, indicators are needed to determine um, what restoration activities would be the most successful and provide a means for evaluating progress made in restoring the ecosystem and also helpful in establishing uh, reference sites for, for, for further um, evaluation planning and so forth for restoration or any sort of uh, uh, ecosystem management efforts. Um, and finally, having uh, indicator information from ecosystems across a range will support the effective allocation of funds for restoration where the conditions warrant the greatest need. Um, as far as for uh, ecosystem health assessments, um, uh, indicators can help the development of scorecards that assess um, both local and Gulf-wide ecosystem health and um, contribute to the, needed, the data needed to support the development of dashboards that help us visualize changes in ecological and ecosystem services over time. want to be clear on a term right now, we're talking about an e eco ecological resilience here, not um, community resilience. So by ecosystem resilience, we're really looking to develop models and indicators that and metrics that help un us understand you know, the potential for recovery from disaster, how well the system represents either historical or the best existing characteristics, and how well it can provide the beneficial ser services to humans. So just to review our approach, we're trying to identify this set of Gulf-wide indicators that give us an understanding of the integrity in the services. We're looking to provide guidance on the measurements that are needed to, um, to understand how the ecosystems are doing relative to the range of natural variation in that ecosystem. And we're looking to choose indicators that can provide insights and resource managers and conservation pr practitioners to guide their work. So our approach for the conceptual um, uh, ecological um, models here was to develop um, a general general model and then fill in the details. Um, so we identified um, the key driver stressors for each system and we um, sort of uh, aggregated those into uh, climate, hydrogeomorphology, and anthropogenic impacts. And then we identified what the key ecological factors or the key ecological integrity factors are those factors that contribute to that. So that includes the abiotic factors, um, the ecosystem structure, which is largely biotic, and then the ecosystem function, which is a combination of the biotic and abiotic factors, and then develop indicators for each of these. Then we wanted to understand how these um, ecological integrity uh, indicators relate to the major ecosystem services. We chose our um, categories um, for the ecosystem services from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and from a workshop that was run by David Yaskowitz for the Heart Research Institute in 2011 um, that resulted in listing of ecosystem services for a number of ecosystems in the Gulf. And those include the supporting services, and by that, those are the processes um, that sustain the ecosystem. Really, everything in the boxes above supporting services are essentially su supporting services. So supporting services have an ecosystem um, service benefit. 
the provisioning services are defined as those that are extractive, things like water, plants, medicines, fuel, and the like. Um, the regulating services are related to the processes that uh, that moderate natural phenomena, things like water purification or erosion and flood control. And then finally, cultural services are the non-material benefits that contribute to the development and the and the cultural advancement of the people who are um, benefiting from the service. So things like recreation and education. So um, once we had a general um, uh, model for each of the um, ecosystems involved and drafted a set of indicators, um, we held two workshops to make sure that um, what the work we were doing um, uh, made sense to the to the experts. So we had a first one we worked on um, as a pilot in 2016. We just worked on salt marshes and it was our essentially our guinea pig for the the process where we worked through all of the methodology development. And then about a year a little less than half a year I guess later we addressed some of the remaining the rest of the all the other four ecosystems. Um, and so we had um, one team that focused on, um, as I said, ecological integrity indicators, and then um, five other teams that worked on the rest of the ecosystems themselves. I'm sorry, that four other teams. So during the workshops, one of the things we did is asked them to rank um, the indicators that we developed um, based on a set of uh, evaluation criteria that we um, developed. We wanted to make sure that um, that first and foremost uh, that, that it, they were informative of the ecosystem services uh, and ecological integrity and their benefits, that they detected long-term trends, that they were repeatable, uh, that they had a precision suitable for analysis that supports management applications, that they could be easily applied by managers, um, that they be applicable at multiple scales and to meet multiple management objectives. Um, ideally, they'd be low cost for data collection, or at least there'd be some multiple alternatives for collecting data on them. And um, ideally, they'd be currently collected somewhere in the Gulf. Um, uh, so we were looking uh, to find, <laughs> it's an interesting process to, to sort of try to rate all of these. Some of them were no-brainers. Yep, they were high on all the other criteria. Others had a real variation in scores between, you know, meeting all of these specific objectives that we had. Um, and so we tried to, we did a scoring process, um, you know, and try to look at the ones that rated the highest. But then, to be honest, we went back through the pile of things that were lower that, um, and gave folks the opportunity to elevate ones which they um, sort of, from their expert uh, judgment, really thought were um, important. Even like, for example, even that they're no longer, not really being collected um, very widely, that maybe they should be. So um, we we had a scoring process, and but we allowed a little bit of. Um, a little wiggle room for the experts to um, to elevate those that were they thought were really important. So this was the um, conceptual model um, framework, uh, and then we began the process uh, of f filling them in. So for the climate drivers, we looked at things like for seagrasses. Now there is, these are all going to be different variables, um, or, or some some similar, some different uh, for each of the different uh, models. And I'm only going to go through this one model today. Um, but so for seagrasses, the, the important climate drivers were climate cycles like El Nino events and major oscillations, um, precipitation, um, especially as it impacts salinity, disturbances, um, including storms and drought and flooding and so forth. Um, the hydro Geomorphical. Let me try that again. Hydrogeomorphological drivers included the um, uh, vertical relief and sediment depths and current and wave energy, and then uh, anthropogenic drivers um, are are varied. Uh, the hydrological alteration includes things like water withdrawal, dams, freshwater inputs, dredging, channelization, and the like. Um, and pollution includes things like storm run runoff river discharge, effluent discharge. Um, recreational activities include things like boating impact and restoration, which is a positive impact, things like vegetation planning. Um, and I, we've all sort of, you know, 
clear, we made this separation between anthropogenic drivers and climate drivers, where of course, you know, we all know that, that climate is also driven by humans, um, but we just didn't get into that for the, you know, for the purposes of this, um, this exercise, but we recognize that to be true. Um, so the next sec, sec piece was to look at the um, abiotic factors. Um, and this is the first time uh, in the model where we actually begin to identify indicators. So um, the two most important um, dr driving abiotic factors are water quality and soil physiochemistry for seagrasses. Um, you'll notice that we didn't come up with any, so we had three indicators for water quality, transparency, phytoplankton, biomass, and sediment load. Um, and uh, although soil physiochemistry is an important in terms of describing the, the ecosystem and how it works, um, we didn't, none of the particular indicators for soil physiochemistry um, sort of made it to the top of the list. Uh, and you'll see that throughout these models. Um, so for example, actually we do have an indicator for each of the ecosystem structure um, pieces. Um, including um, community structure, abundance, morphology, and chemical constituents. And that's chemical constituents of the leaf tissue, not the water. Um, and then finally, looking at the important um, factors related to ecosystem function, uh, we identified one uh, that had an indicator, which is scallop abundance. Not to say those others aren't important, but they just didn't provide um, uh, indicators that rose to the top. Uh, now I'll say that um, we decided we were kind of going to try to shoot for about, you know, eight to ten-ish uh, indicators for each of the ecosystems. It just seemed like a manageable number. We didn't limit it one way or the other, but that's the order of magnitude that we were looking at um, for the in integrity measures. And then, um, then we started, then we uh, had on a handful of about four to six additional ecosystem service indicators. So for habitat, um, for supporting uh, services, hab provision of habitat is important. And you'll notice scallop abundance, um, we get a twofer in that one because um, the habitat or the provi provision of um, secondary production is essentially the same as habitat provision. So you, know, you can measure one thing and get at two pieces of the, um, uh, of the model. Likewise, food. This is, I put this one in here because we do have one indicator that's listed three times because scallops are also provide food to humans. And we had three regulating um, indicators, as you can see here. And finally, um, recreational fisheries, the cultural one related to um, seagrass. And um, in that case, we were um, looking at landings of spotted sea trout, which are highly related to um, uh, to, to seagrass uh, ecosystems. Now there is some challenges with this ecosystem and I do want to note that um, we're still, the ecosystem integrity measures for all of these models that I'm going to talk about today um, are, uh, are final and in the write-up stage. Um, actually we have uh, drafts written and we're just pulling things together. We're still in the review stage and waiting for a couple of reviewers to get back to, to us on the ecosystem services one. So these might change a little bit. Okay, so that's an example. We ha I'm only gonna show this one for now, for today, but we have you know four others just like it for each of the other ecosystems. Now, I um, we did go through the exercise of drawing all of the lines and of the linkages between the key indicators um, and all of these various factors, but it became um, a plate of spaghetti very fast in terms of how messy it was visually. So I'm going to sp spare you from that, but we, pr we will go through and figure out how to highlight the most important pathways between the, the, uh, the drivers and, the, um, and each of the um, indicators themselves um, in terms of, because they're especially important in terms of highlighting what, where, what can managers do if, you know, if they're losing uh, erosion, what are the sorts of things that they can manipulate that look higher in the model to identify what is a potential um, uh, thing that can be managed so that they can reduce reduction. So that's one of the linkages between the models itself and actually developing the management um, priorities and uh, uh, actions. 
Okay, so the next step is to go from the models, so it's nice to, and then to the actual indicators, which I showed you that we developed the indicators. But then how do you actually measure these things in the field and how do you know a good one when you see it, right? So how, how are we gonna do that? Um, the one thing that's important is that, you know, metrics and their assessment points are meant to be site-based. So how do we measure and assess the condition of this particular place? And how do we know whether it's in good shape um, or not based on the metrics? So I'm gonna just digress here for a second and use a, an example that everybody's familiar with to sort of ground you. Um, uh, I'll use the example of blood level, um, blood cholesterol. We know that it's an indicator of risks of heart and vascular disease. Um, and you're all very familiar with it, of course. So that's the indicator is blood cholesterol level. There are multiple metrics or ways to assess that particular um, indicator. You can look at total cholesterol, the HDL, the LDL, or an index, which is a, a relationship between the two. And ideally, you know, when the, the doctor goes and, and when you get your res lab results back, they'll give you an indication of where you fit in the range from good to poor um, based on the number you get. Um, so, oh, and nobody, uh, please don't use these uh, levels. That, uh, these may well have even come off of Facebook or the internet somewhere. So, you know, don't don't worry if, uh, the, please don't use these numbers for anything um, other than this example. Um, so, but the idea is the same. We're trying to, to develop exactly the same sorts of assessment points to be able to score a particular site based on um, its values for each of the metrics that we're looking at. So, um, this is just an example. I'm going to tell you about the outcomes, outputs from this project. The output, um, this is just not a full level of the salt marsh um, metrics, but our in intent is. Uh, you know, based on what I can fit on this page, is to show you that um, we have indicators, metrics, and measures for each of the ecosystems, um, as well as narratives that provide the rationale for our scaling and our assessment points and, and sort of background on the general ecology. Um, and then here's an, a similar example that we have um, uh, for um, ecosystem service metrics. I'll tell you that I didn't include the measures here because we're still, that's where we, we were still working on those. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's exactly analogous to, um, we'll be going the same direction as we're going for the um, eco ecosystem integrity uh, indicators as well. So to give you an example of how the um, uh, assessment points work, they, these particular ones for salt marsh were developed through an analysis of the literature so for the combined good and excellent rating, um, these assessment point values were not set to um, um, extremely high that, so that they would encompass the majority of the records of typical, that are typical across a marsh gradient. So this range of the greater than 600 grams per meter square represents what's seen for, um, for the values of, of presumably healthy marshes through most of the Gulf and Southeastern Atlantic coast studies that we looked at. Um, the values for the Fair rating were derived from some the same analysis, but with values that encompass the, encompass the lower third of the studies. And finally, the poor rating was based on values from known degraded sites. Um, I probably should go back and, and I've been using this term assessment points. Um, and that's what I mean by these, these specific um, ranges of values for the metric. I, some people call these thresholds and that's what we started calling them. Um, but it, it connotes, the term threshold con connotes an ecological tipping point and that we know it. Um, and in this case, we don't always know that there's some ecological tipping point, you know, where collapse may happen and so forth. So we're, we sort of pulled back on it and said, these are assessment points. This is what we can tell by looking at the literature and so forth. And if we knew there are th thresholds, then we indicated that, that they're, you know, important for some reason. But if they're unknown, we just sort of uh, go to that more general term. So here's just another one to, um, to give you an example of some of the sorts of things we did. Um, so this metric uh, of salinity, summer mean salinity was chosen because salinity influences the overall growth and mortality and to a lesser degree re reproduction in oysters. 
And so although oysters occur in a large range of salinity from like zero to 40 practical salinity units, there uh, little or no growth occurs when the salinities drop below five um, PSU. Um, so several studies have documented limited to no recruitment when salinity is below 10, which can affect oyster size and very availability of the substrate. Um, and higher salinities can be associated with greater uh, instances of disease and, and um, predation. So for excellent and poor, we looked at the overall ranges. It's better to be in the sweet spot between 12 and 20, but if you're a little lower or a little higher, then you can still be in, in the good range. If you're lower than those um, five and lower to 25, um, some oysters can tolerate um, uh, these suboptimal levels for a number of days. And so our good and fair, poor, our fair and poor values are based on the time outside of those optimal ranges. So we have these sorts of assessment points and descriptions for each of the um, metrics that we've developed. So I'm going to pause there and then turn, I'm going to change a little direction here and talk about, so now that we have indicators and metrics and their assessment points and the narratives, um, we wanted to understand how well they are being collected right now in the Gulf. So um, Matt Love from the Ocean Conservancy and his colleagues assembled an enormous database of monitoring programs in the Gulf um, with run roughly 900 long-term monitoring efforts um, categorized with lots of metadata associated with that, including the data that they collect and how they collect it. Um, it was originally developed to um, support the 13 NERDA injury categories, and MAD did some additional searching and, and uh, massaging of the data to help us identify what indicator data are being collected for our five ecosystems in the Gulf. And MAD added driver salt marsh mangroves to the, for this particular project that weren't in his original study. So this is uh, essentially each one of these has, well, many of them have a, a footprint, um, which I'll talk about in a second. So this inventory, um, provided insights into the number of existing monitoring programs that are collecting some sort of data related to our ecosystems. So 30 um, programs that, uh, that MAD inventory collects something about corals and nearly 90 pr uh, produce programs collect something about salt marshes. Sometimes they were relevant and sometimes not so much. Um, we only included, MAD only included programs that produce publicly accessible information so some data would be, uh, are probably being collected. There are things that are not being made available that were not part of the inventory. So if there's an individual study or long-term monitoring, um, but it's not being, um, the data aren't published or, or publicly available, then they're not included. So this may be, if anything, these are an underestimated of the actual data that are being collected. Um, so this, as I said, this inventory was built upon a previous effort to, develop, to document all the monitoring programs that were collected with a five-year minimum of data. We relaxed that minimum data requirement um, and included short, shorter to, uh, term pr uh, programs um, uh, uh, to be able to find uh, as much data as we could about our particular five targeted ecosystems. Um, so a subset of the programs in the inventory also provided a footprint of the where the sampling area was or some information on um, where it was collected. And we, uh, that is maintained in a separate geodatabase. So we have footprints for a lot of the sampling, but not for all of it. So some of the things I'll, I'll tell you about in a little while are also an underestimated. So things might be better than, I, I'm gonna, than they seem as we go forward here. So our job was to figure out how the data in the monitoring program relates to the data needed to support our recommended e indicators. Most of the projects had some information on the data collected, but at a variety of levels of granularity. Sometimes we could tell that they were the same, sometimes not so much. Sometimes they used different terms for the same measure and we could figure that out. Um, sometimes they used the same term for an indicator, but it was collected differently. Um, our, in our first pass, we're trying to identify potential for overlap and opportunities to make use of these data as, um, as practitioners in the Gulf think about the needs for more comprehensive monitoring programs. Um, uh, we did some follow-up with the programs. 
um, but it was beyond the scope of this particular project to interview each one and make sure that we had a ro super robust. We're trying to get a sense and a gist of the, the level of collection of data on these sorts of things. So what resulted is the best crosswalk of the data terms that we could do. Um, it would be great to follow up with each of these programs to enhance our, uh, the initial survey. So we also pulled together the best available information that we could find on the dis distribution of each of these habitats from a variety of data sources and to build um, habitat distribution maps. Um, and then we overlaid the footprint of the monitoring to programs that collect each indicator So and, and provided this all in a geodatabase. So this particular... Um, so this is salt marsh. So this salt marsh data come f came from the Environmental Sensitivity Index, National Wetlands Inventory, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, USGS Texas, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and Louisiana State uh, University Atlas. So we, this is an example of how we pulled together the um, salt marsh habitat data, as well as where the data are collected. Um, so I'm just going to give you a uh, flash through a quick summary of um, sorts of um, what what the results look like. Um, so these are the salt marsh metrics that we came up with. There are eight eco, eco integrity metrics across five key attributes and five ecosystem services. Um, as same was the salt marsh example. You'll note that some of the um, integrity measures are also the service measures. So then I'll uh, next I'll show you what we did. Um, to visualize these data. So the light tan is the distribution of um, salt marsh throughout the Gulf. Um, to display the data in a useful way, we employed um, an existing 100 square kilometer hex map to provide the total habitat distribution, whether data for the indicators are being collected under um, each hex unit. Um, so this is the distribution of the biomass indicator. It's very well studied in Louisiana where the CRIMS program project is working. Um, and it's also monitored sparsely, somewhat sparsely in Texas and Florida. Um, you can show, say this is a general distribution of the indicator where it's collected, but it doesn't give um, the sampling intensity. So clearly, you know, sometimes it's, it may be may, way more uh, intensely sampled in, in Louisiana where they're doing quite a bit of work and less so in the other areas. So on to oysters. Um, so the important things were salinity, oxygen, changing in the area of substrate, disease, um, changes in the structure of the um, oyster reefs, including their area and their height, and the density of live oysters relative to the regional mean. As far as providing habitat, we looked at species rich, think we should be looking at species rich, richness and the biomass of resident species. And for ecosystem services, we're looking at um, the density of naked goby, which is highly correlated with oyster communities, the number of com com commercial oyster landings as a food service, sh coastal projection as measured through shoreline change, and then water quality as measured um, through uh, basin-wide total suspended solids. And um, for recreation, we looked at the number of recreational anglers, anglers in the oyster area. Now, one thing I'll also note um, is that there are pretty good data um, for the ecosystem integrity measures. Um, it's really hard to find um, data. In fact, there's only one or two of the, um, the indicators for ecosystem services that there's any really regularly collected data on. Um, they certainly, there were none in um, Matt's, very few in the Ocean Conservancy. A database. It was beyond the scope of this um, project to try to find all of the, um, you know, the data on uh, recreational uh, fishing, although some of those are available. Um, so we don't have great um, information on the distribution of the ecosystem service uh, indicators themselves, except where they overlap with the ecosystem integrity indicators. So here's an example of the oyster um, distribution in the in the kind of the army green, and the highlighted cells are those where some uh, studies are collecting information on the pre prevalence of the dermo disease. Um, for seagrasses, there are a handful of water quality 
uh, metrics, including surface irradiance, chlorophyll A, and total suspended solids. Um, changes in ARL extent and percent cover, um, there's a lot of data on those, uh, as well as the species dominance index. For morphology, morphology they were really looking at um, shoot allometry, including length of uh, the leaves and width of the leaves. And then, the, as I said, the chemical constituents relates to the um, uh, chemical constituents of the leaves themselves, not the water, and that includes uh, nutrient limitation index that's calculated, as well as stable isotopes um, ratios. And again, scallop density for uh, secondary production, as well as the habitat and the food. You'll see basin white suspended solids coming up um, again and again in terms of importance for water quality, soil carbon density, measuring carbon sequestration, and then finally shoreline change again for coastal protection. So here's an example of the um, seagrass distribution in the green and the highlighted um, transparency indicator. Um, and I'm showing you this one in particular because um, there are two ways to measure um, transparency, either by through LICOR or through sec secchi depth. Um, but the results of these can be compared, and so we included both of them, either or, on the map. In fact, most a lot of studies will collect both. Um, so there's not a big difference in the, between the LICOR map by itself and the Secchi depth map by itself. Okay, the corals um, were tricky because um, there aren't, as I said earlier, there's not a lot of um, data collected um, uh, on corals in the Gulf. Our corals are, are in the Gulf. We included this, everything that was sort of inside the Keys and north around to the flower garden banks. Um, I guess I really, you know, I don't have to, to list all these, but um, you'll notice that, you know, many of them are related to the easily and often um, measured things like disease, bleaching, and um, recent and old mortality, um, as well as um, measures uh, relating, related to um, water quality. So here's an example of um, temperature regime indicator for corals. Um, as I said, they're the least well monitored of the five systems we looked at. There's a lot of water quality monitoring that can be used to assess corals because there are a lot of programs that just collect water quality data. Um, but there are some challenges in using it. Um, in many cases, uh, we would found that they were collecting water temperature, for example, but we couldn't tell whether they were um, using it, collecting it at depth or for sea surface temperature. Um, so sea surface temperature is not a very good indicator of coral health. It's really uh, temperature at depth. So you know this would be a, a follow-on piece is to sort of sort through all of those studies and figure out um, exactly which ones are collecting it at depth um, to get a better sense of what we were going. We were um, uh, we were pretty modest in the ones that we we chose. We felt like we we needed to know that it was temperature at depth um, before we were including it in this map. So this could be an underestimate of the temperature or data that are actually included. Oh, and this is just my um, um, true confession map here, which is um, uh, you know in one case you'll see over I think it's floral flower garden banks right here <laughs> only one program, long-term monitoring program of the 30 for corals is collecting macro algae percent cover. But our team thought it was a really important one to, to begin collecting. And this is one of those cases where we might be advocating for additional data collection on macro algae percent cover um, at, because it really does do a good job at, um, at, um, as an indicator of a potential decline uh, being taken over by macro algae. And then similarly for mangroves, I, you know, I, I don't need to, to list all of these as we're going to get a little shorter on time, um, but it's the same sort of things. And you'll see some of these uh, additional ecosystem services um, repeating for mango, mangroves and um, as well as um, those for um, similar, very similar between mangroves and salt marshes in terms of the um, nutrients and conductivity. In fact, when they were developing the mangrove model, they used um, the salt marsh model as a jumping off point and just changed it a little bit to, um, to uh, because they are very similar um, uh, ecosystems that, um, you know, sort of uh, are, are in the same ecological space depending on the temperature. So. 
this one is an, uh, an example of um, the eutrophication or the basin-wide nutrient load for um, total uh, nitrogen and total phosphorus. So those are the examples of the sorts of data that are coming out of this project. Um, we developed all those ecological, conceptual ecological models. We drafted the indicators and metrics, including the screening criteria, calibration, and assessment points. We drafted maps of eco, each ecosystem um, golf-wide and for the distribution of indicator monitoring. And we're currently in the writing and communicating stage and to trying to figure out how to make the uh, information public and, and getting it out there. Um, you should probably begin to see um, products from this um, in the uh, late fall. So what's next? Uh, a lot of people ask me about are we coordinating with other efforts, and we are. We also are looking at developing and thinking about how to bring these data together so that they can be useful um, at a scale beyond just the individual site, but what can we say about these um, data as we begin to indicate? Uh, aggregate, and, um, and how can we develop analysis and visualization tools that support them, um, and so that we can make the most of the data. So we are working with other efforts. Um, I've been working with um, Steve Giordano at the Restore Council um, Monitoring Community of Practice, um, and he's, in fact, he was one of the experts on our, um, on our group. Um, for the NERDA Trustee Council, um, that also has a charge to development monitoring indicators. Greg Steyer was one from USGS is, is leading that group and he was one of the co-PIs on this project. So he's well aware of what we're doing. Uh, we've been working with the folks in Florida CCAR project, which is developing a set of state level indicators based on existing information. And we've provided them with all of the, um, our, our sort of early results on this so that they could use that to help um, guide their efforts. The Florida Panhandle L LCC is also developing um, some uh, some indicators, and we've been talking with them. Um, and we're also going to be attending a, a seagrass monitoring workshop, an indicator workshop um, held by Larry Hanley of USGS and Catherine Lockwood to identify monitoring and assessment needs for that for seagrasses. So that's coming up, and we'll be involved in, in in doing that. And sort of we're open to others, and there are other communications that we've been having to, because there are uh, you know a, quite a few efforts. Um, geared towards identifying and, uh, indicators as well as um, making sure that monitoring programs in the Gulf are being um, as effective as they can. And um, so we really have tried to hard to, to communicate with these other efforts. Um, so what's next in terms of what do we do with this information? Um, Ideally, now that we have a recommended set of indicators and, and we have a sense of who's collecting them, we should be bringing those data together and making it available for analysis. Um, and so we've been developing this vision for next steps. Um, ESRI has a new software product, a hub software product that allows data providers to keep and manage their own data, but publish it via web services to a common portal that's available to the broader community of, uh, uh, for multiple purposes. So we see the, the utility in terms of allowing to aggregate standard indicator and monitoring ecosystem data from multiple data providers while allowing them to keep their and manage their own data, um, as well as to um, allow providers to update the portal as new monitoring and ecosystem distribution are collected. Um, also by providing, so that, that's all the stuff that's on the left side of this diagram, which is the, you know, the publishers collaborate together through this convening portal and then making it, you know, available to, for any number of uses, including the ones that I started out, the applications we started talking about at the beginning of this, this talk. Um, the one thing that's also nice about this potential software and the vision that we're developing is it allows um, users to provide, or the data providers to provide links to the raw or the other source data that they, um, that they uh, collected, at, you know, as part of their indicator and monitoring program, as long as they're willing to share it, that, that the utility could be there. Um, so that also, you know, this sounds very kumbaya, but there is really a non-trivial standardization step associated with this exercise. Uh, you know, we taught, we had to go through that crosswalking process to figure out what data were collected and how they were collected and whether they were collected the same way. Um, we would, as a community of practitioners, need to figure out what we can do to standardize existing data sets and squeeze the most out of the data that we can. Um, to be able to um, provide for sort of all of those needs that are provided on the, you know, that are identified on the right hand of this diagram. 
And finally, this portal, in our vision, it would need to support analyses of current state and trends of the performance measures at multiple scales. Um, this is a particular, um, uh, well, we need to be able to provide visualization tools such as graphs and maps like this that support the reporting and analysis. Um, we envision using tools like NatureServe's biodiversity dashboard to support these analyses and visualization needs. In this particular example, the um, trends in clean water score from the Ocean Health Index is produced at a scale of country. Users should be able to select the indicator, the scale, and the data, and the trend maps that they want to display. Um, we had to pretty, you know, we had to search a little bit for some uh, uh, data set that we could use to indicate, uh, to visualize an indicator data. Ideally, we should be able to, to produce golf-wide reports on the ecological integrity of our five ecosystems by taking advantage of the data for these indicators that are already collected. So I will stop there. Um, Sarah, do you want to moderate questions? Yep. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone that there are two ways to ask questions. You can type them into the question panel of the user interface, and I'll relay them to Kathy, or you can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you. Um, but that only works if you have a working microphone or if you enter the pin, or, pin number uh, when you're on the phone. So actually, we have, yep, we have several questions. Let's go ahead, get started. Um, uh, there's a question as to, this was early on, when will the reports be released for all habitats? Yeah, so um, as soon as I write them. <laughs> gotcha. I'm kidding. Um, so, no, um, so we are in the writing stage right now. We're in the reviewing stage for ecosystem services. And so, you know, fingers crossed, everything ready. Um, I will have a relaxed Thanksgiving dinner because they'll all be out. Um, and if I'm in a bad mood at Christmas, you'll know why. But, um, uh, but really, you know, that's that's sort of where we're where we're shooting for. Okay. Uh, there was a request to go back one slide about the inventory reporting e system. Maybe if you want to just flash back or show that one for a little bit. Let's see if I can get. Let me see if I can get it to go back. It's stuck, Sarah. All right. Well, um, okay. Just, um, um, there, this one. Yep. There you go. Yep. And uh, let's see. Let's see. It appears, or here's another question. It appears you and your collaborators are moving towards universal monitoring metrics for the entire Gulf for the five ecosystems. Would you say this is the case? If yes, did you compare your oyster monitoring metrics with what is listed in the Oyster Habitat Restoration Monitoring and Assessment Handbook released a couple of years ago, which contains universal monitoring metrics? So um, I'll answer the second question first. Yes, we did. Um, in fact, uh, Chris Shepard, who's from the Nature Conservancy, um, is um, used that as the basis for much of the oyster um, uh, monitoring metrics that they're producing. Um, so it was sort of an easy job for them because that was already um, in existence. And um, so we were, um, they, and there were some updates to those based on um, uh, you know, what, whatever the expert said. So I don't know if it's word for word. It's certainly not word for word, but it was highly um, um, influenced by that work. Um, and Christine Shepard was, you know, uh, highly motivated to make sure that that was true, being, uh, you know, part of TNC and, and making sure that that, that happened. Um, and in, for, in terms of moving towards um, standardized monitoring programs for the Gulf, that sure would be nice. Um, I'm not in a position to lead that effort necessarily. I think, you know, things like the Restore Council and the NERDA Council are going to have to try to figure out um, if there are some um, monitoring metrics um, that they can um, suggest that would, um, you know, that folks would agree to um, to standardize. But as I said, it's non-trivial. Um, so I think that is a vision that we would all like to have. How soon or whether we can get there. This is a start um, and we'll see what we can do in terms of at least making the best use of existing data. We certainly recognize fully that people with 20 years of data aren't going to want to change their metrics necessarily because that would, you know, ruin their great streak. But um, so uh, one can hope, but it's not 
necessarily the only guidance. Certainly these indicator metrics are going to be, um, indicators and metrics are going to be important for local restoration efforts and uh, resource management efforts as well. Okay. But thanks. I can tell you that the CCAR, I want to say one other thing, the CCAR um, group in Florida is in fact trying to come up with a set of Florida um, uh, standard indicators. Um, and, you know, they're using the, the stuff that we've done as an inspiration, but they are also highly um, motivated toward data that are already collected. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, another question, big picture. How transferable do you think the models, indicators, metrics, and or measurements for each habitat are to regions outside of the Gulf of Mexico? Oh, good question. Um, I think some of them are going to be really transferable. Some of them, um, you know, and it just really depends on the ecosystem. Um, I know that we're looking at some um, metrics for um, uh, mangroves, you know, in the more southern Gulf, and they, they seem really similar. You know, we haven't really tested it how well they are a lot. We certainly were took from other inspiration from literature from other areas, but we, um, in terms of things we should be looking at, but we really haven't. Um, some, I think the, an the short answer is some will and some won't, and we don't really know exactly yet. Okay, all right, thanks, Kathy. Um, and this was a question that came in relatively early, and maybe I missed it, but how are the metrics selected? Is it only expert opinion? Um, so it was, um, they did a fair amount of literature review, identifying what sort of data were being collected, um, what, what are important in terms of identifying um, ecosystem integrity, and then finally it was um, the selection process. You know, we, we sort of came up with a short list based on best professional judgment, and then they were essentially selected based on um, conversations that happened in the workshops. Um, based on the evalu uh, rating them based on the evaluation criteria, and then the best professional judgment of the experts involved. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, a question that came in, is NatureServe tracking who uses the data and how? Um, is NatureServe, you, I'm gonna say no, um, not yet, other than um, because we don't have the data all pulled together yet. Um, and we were really relying on the data information from um, the Ocean Conservancy database in terms of who's collecting what data. We didn't really go to the who's using it um, side, and that's a good question. And no, we didn't do that. Okay. Um, let's see. Was there any consideration of incorporating ocean coastal acidification into some of the indicators, uh, such as oysters or reefs? There are a number of efforts currently advanced by NOAA to monitor relevant data, which you might find of aid. Um, I, I guess we'd like to look at that. The, um, they looked at a number of the water chemistry and water quality um, um, uh, metrics, and I don't, to be honest, now, I wasn't in each of those conversations when they were happening, so I actually don't know that answer. I, I don't know if anybody on my team is here. Um, anybody I should look for? I can. Uh, let's see. Someone type in a. I can't see. So I guess the answer is um, I imagine that they were considered, and I don't know why they weren't collected, but I will pass that on to the team in terms of making sure that they were um, properly addressed. I wish I knew, but I don't. As okay. I said, I'm speaking for the, you know, the great work of the others. So some of these details, um, I'm not the best person to ask uh, okay. as much as I'd like to be. If you're doing a great job answering all the questions so far. Um, let's see. Here's a, a good one. I'm assuming there are many indicators that do not have monitoring programs collecting data. Moving forward, what will the process be for recommending and filling data gaps in indicators? So, um, you know, your guess is as good as mine. I, I think what's uh, the best uh, venue for that is going to be the um, the NERDA Trustee Council and the Restore uh, Monitoring uh, Community Data 
let me try that again, community of practice, but also, you know, the and the, as well as, you know, I didn't list here, and I should have, I'm embarrassed that I didn't, is the GOMA um, monitoring and data team. So there are three efforts that are trying to coordinate people, uh, groups across the Gulf, and they're trying to themselves come through. We were trying to help provide them and others with sort of baseline information on here's how we would do it if you ask us. Um, so, you know, NatureServe doesn't have any, um, you know, any authority whatsoever um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, trying to suggest what people collect. I'm hoping that they'll that this will provide some imp inspiration for the groups who might decide that, you know, as a community, we should be collecting these other data as well. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a question about industry collaborators. Okay, with respect to collaborators, there does not appear to be industry or business stakeholders. Is that the case? Would they, wouldn't they have info to contribute and also benefit, of, let's see, benefit uh, by the project metrics? Um, yes, and I'm glad you said that because it should be on the right-hand side under these users. As I said, when we were focusing on this project, we were really focused on data providers um, and on the ecology um, of the systems as, as, as well as the ecosystem services. So um, our, our, we were really more focused on the let's provide information and probably, you know, it would have been better if we were more thinking about the outcome and the users. But, um, and we're now we're starting to think about, we were sort of more taking a, a more um, sort of methodical approach to developing ecosystems based e indicators based on the literature and based on what we knew was going on. Um, and so certainly we should add industry to that list on the right, but we, they were not, um, none of these groups were specifically targeted when we were developing the indicators themselves. As we said, we're focused more on the science and less on the use. Um, a question, uh, were human dimensions considered beyond ecosystem services? I guess I don't know exactly what that means. Um, we, human dimensions were considered in the way such that ecosystem, human dimensions, humans are drivers of some of these ecosystems. So that top driver sections, that whole anthropogenic section, and then at the end where, you know, who's, who benefits. And one thing I didn't say, and I should have, which was when we focused on um, the ecosystem services, we were focused on um, the ability of the system to provide the service. We didn't cross over into the social services um, uh, piece of it, the social uh, science piece of it, where we were trying to monetize anything or look at the actual benefit, you know, whether that food went in somebody's mouth or not. Um, we didn't try to do that because that's not our strength. We're, you know, we're a science organization, not a social science organization. So we were really focused on eco provision of services rather than the, the realization of the, um, of the service itself. I don't know if that's the, what that, if that's what you meant, but that's, that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Other follow up if there's additional questions there. Thank you. Um, two more quick questions. Uh, are the clean water scores relative to each other? Um, it says countries are only relative to themselves. Clean water scores. They would be, I, I think you're looking at the water quality things. There are a number of indexes and total suspended solids and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, it's in the report and I'd have to go look it up um, in terms of the in metrics themselves. I think they were relative to under how they related to the health of the ecosystem itself. So there might be different cutoffs for total suspended solids for, um, uh, you know, for one, for uh, seagrasses that require highly, tr require highly transparent than there would be for, um, um, salt marshes that require, a, you know, a certain amount of sedimentation is a good thing. Um, so likewise, you know, chlorophyll A is great for oysters, not so much for seagrasses. So I think those water quality um, things were, were all done relative to how they impact the ecosystem itself and the, you know, the sort of the, the live part of the ecosystem. Okay. 
Um, there's been a number of questions as to whether uh, people can see the PowerPoint. Um, I'll consult with Kathy about this. Regardless, we will we will definitely be posting the recording of this webinar. Uh, it'll be on mm -hmm. openchannels.org within a few hours, and I'll see if Kathy is able to share the PowerPoint. Sometimes presenters are, sometimes they're not. Um, and if she is, we will all, we'll post it on the same web page. So uh, if yeah, you're and I'll have to ask my group about that, how they feel about it, because the ecosystem services piece isn't um, complete, um, and so I just don't want it to. So we'll, we'll I'll, I'll see how they feel about that. Okay. Okay. Know. Great. And uh, just to let everyone know, um, you'll get a uh, if you want the link, you can email me. Just hit reply to any of the reminders you got, and I think there'll be a follow up message too. You could hit uh, reply to that, and I can send you the link where the recording will be, and if the PowerPoint can be shared. Uh, W that will be on the same page. Uh, there was also a question. Uh, Kathy, are, are you okay sharing your email address? Sure. Uh, I can, uh, let's see. It's, I'll Love type it into the pal. Okay. It's Kathy, I should know this often, uh, underscore Gooden. Underscore Gooden. Gooden at natureserve.org. Okay. I'm going to put it in the uh, text, the chat box, everyone, that actually should appear for you. Okay. And also, there was a question as to whether uh, ever, people could be noticed when the framework is done and published. And um, uh, Kathy will, will have contact information for the people who uh, registered for the webinar. And so that, that would be one venue for sharing. Oh, I'd be happy uh, to do that. That would be awesome. Yeah, so uh, that can be done too. Okay, so lots of thanks uh, for a really great presentation, Kathy, for coming in through the comments and for me. Uh, this is just represents an amazing amount of work uh, this team has done. So we really appreciate you sharing it with us. My pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks to everybody that came. Uh, and I look forward to talking. If you see you at meetings, I really like, to, you know, look forward to you to introducing yourself to me and and you know, uh, if you have certain um, you know, things that we can talk about together. That'd be awesome. Okay, great. Thanks, Kathy. Bye, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.